Thank you, everyone, for joining this panel. So as Sam said, I'm Frank. I work for the UNICEF Office of Research at Innocenti. And as you expect from UNICEF, I bring in the perspectives of children and the youth in the whole continuum of peace building. So just um, by way of context, we know many conflicts and fragile situations are based on some kind of an identity differential. And this identity can be ethnic, can be religious, can be caste, race, political affiliation, geographical, and other times even sporting affiliations. The kind of the sporting teams that people support can be a form of tension and conflict within societies. Um, Oftentimes, these differentials are correlated to some sort of inequalities of opportunities or outcomes. And these inequalities can be real or can just be perceived. So you can imagine a case where some ethnic group settles in an area of a country that is less fertile in terms of the land. And this difference in fertility of the land leads to differentials in economic outcomes. And the people that live in the place that has less fertile land begin to believe that their disadvantage is a result of some identity related to their ethnic group, although the real confounding factor is the geographical location of where these different ethnic groups are located within the, the geographical space. We can also identify that there are risks of conflict species when there's an affinity towards these identity groups dominate the affinity towards the national group. So in a country, there are these typical questions whether you feel how attached you are to your group compared to how much you are attached to your national identity. And I'll, I'll show a slide on this um, later on. So we know some of the worst forms of conflict, typically genocide, for example, are perpetrated along the lines of this kind of identity differentials. So one, ethnic group, whether they are dominant in terms of political space or military capacity, using this to systematically malign and eliminate another group altogether. And there are a lot of these tensions that exist in different contexts. So we know the children of today and the youth are the future of tomorrow. And for those who follow the demographics, we know about 60% of the world population now are under 40 in some countries, that is more. So, and they are going to constitute 100% of the future, the children and the youth. And the most effective pathway of eliminating this kind of identity differential is through systematically trying to dilute and neutralize these polarizing effects of the identity that drives conflicts in the long run. And this can be achieved through reengineering of these identity affinities. So for example, if in my country, I. I belong to one ethnic group, and I want to, my affinity towards that ethnic group is more than my affinity to the national interest, then that creates tension and conflict between the different ethnic groups that live in this country. So over time, systematically neutralizing and diluting these affinities will create more cohesive societies going forward. And that's where we focus on the, the children and the youth. So we have these two graphs from the African Afrobarometer studies that look at different countries and ask a, a number of questions. It's a very rich set of data if you, you want to have a look. And these two graphs here show us on the first slide, maybe not too visible to read, but the question is whether you, there are different ethnic groups and religious groups in the country, whether you somewhat identify there's more that divide you or there's more that unite you as a country. And the one on the left shows across the different countries what the perceptions are. So whether there's more that unite or there's more that divide the people in the country. And on the other side, there's, there are these questions about how people feel about their identity. So affinity to, let's say, one, the national or their ethnic group. And people respond about whether they feel equally towards the ethnic group and they are their country or they feel more of the eth ethnic group than the country or they feel more identified with their country than the ethnic group. 
And here, with this data, we begin to drill down on which ethnic groups, which demographics, which kinds of people are responding to which questions about how they identify, whether they feel more strongly towards their ethnic group or their national identity, and who they are, where they live, and what defines them. And we look at also this and correlate it with other outcomes within the country, the, the, the conflict situation in the country, the number of fragilities, the number of actual conflict incidents in the past 20 years, and how they have been able to recover from conflict situations. And I'm sure those of you who attended some of the, the closing session yesterday heard about the case in, for example, in Myanmar, where you have different ethnic groups and the dominant ethnic group trying to do this through um, uh, coercive assimilation of their population, whereas there are other approaches to doing this, and the intervention that was talked about yesterday was using education actually to be more inclusive of the minority ethnic groups and how they can be included. So studying these patterns and how the situation of the countries and the conflict lines that persist have four key takeaways from from this one, the number one from studying these countries shows that the heavy-handedness assimilation does not work overall. So when one ethnic group tries to dominate the others through assimilation, that does not work in general. And a more constructive approach would be through integration and sometimes amnesia. So you're trying to neutralize the presence of the ethnic groups or some identities that are actually more divisive than cohesive. And you can, like in the case of Rwanda, where it is now even an offense to ask any question about ethnic identity in the country, with the hope that over time there will not be, people will not be identified by the ethnic groups to foster this sense of identity and continuous bargaining. There's another school of thought about um, multiculturalist interventions and also trying to institute quota systems where every ethnic group has a quota instead of trying to wish this away through a process of amnesia or forced integration. But in general, coercive assimilation would not work and more progressive approaches of integration and amnesia will be recommended. The second point is creating opportunities for more engagement interaction among these different the children and youth from different ethnic groups. So again, if you look at the adult population, they often tend to be more ingrained and more entrenched with their positions in terms of their affinity to their groups. So if they, are, they feel more towards their ethnic group and they are elderly, they tend to sustain this, this kind of affinity over time. So the real opportunity is to educate the children and the youth in a different way that, again, dilutes and over time neutralize these affinity effects that leads to, to conflict. So especially in fragility settings, the real goal is to promote more engagement and more interaction. And I can talk of an example in, in Ghana, for example, where there is a residential high school system. So people from different ethnic groups get to go to boarding schools in, in different cities. So you move from your locality, go to a boarding school with people from other identities and that has created more cohesive society and more less tensions in terms of ethnic and religious identities. The third point is also engaging youth and children from diverse groups in finding solutions to risk factors. We know when these identity differentials and affinities exist, there are ultimate triggers that lead to conflict and that could be issues of water stress, um, unemployment, social mobility, feelings of exclusion, and people really not understanding the, uh, the composition of their group in terms of the, the national discourse. So in cases where people might feel excluded, it might just be a matter of they not understanding that the share of their group in the national population is proportional to the representation they already have in government. But looking at the numbers in government, they feel they are in the minority and they are excluded from, from governance. So creating, engaging these youth to find solutions also tends to foster the, the national affinity more than these narrow group affinities and that promotes cohesion in the long run. The fourth final one is making the youth understand that peaceful coexistence, dialogue, and, and the irreparable dangers of conflict to their futures. So often the perpetrators of these conflicts are elderly people 
who have egos and agendas that are beyond the interests of the youth. And we heard from yesterday how the outcomes of conflict can be very differential for different age groups and different geographies. So making the youth and children really understand that they stand to lose the most in times of conflict. They have their futures ahead of them. They have irreparable damage. And even including some of these texts in the educational curricula helps them to understand and appreciate the risk of conflict, the opportunities for peaceful resolution. And this generally leads to more affinity towards the nation, the state interest than their group interest. And this also facilitates cohesion within the, the country. So thank you very much. And I'll be happy to take questions.